know again the word process is very easily thrown around in academic studios but process means nothing if it doesn't connect you to your work the founder of a multidisciplinary architecture practice architecture discipline architect akshat bhat the studio's work spans very uh, through varied typologies from residential and retail interiors to large scale public and commercial assignments it is known that the outcome of every commission is determined by a series of design processes and as a result all these all their buildings are integrated from the conceptual framework to tactile experience Hi, good morning. Um, I assume that um, uh, you've studied a bit about what architecture discipline is and what the studio does um, before you, uh, you know before you attend this talk. Um, but I will run you through briefly the foundation of the studio, and then our current works, and then move on to focusing on. uh hospitality works as such um and i'm going to correct my introduction a bit i believe while while the term multidisciplinary studio is used a lot these days studios design studios i believe or architectural architectural design studios were always multidisciplinary even if you look at corbusier studio you design multiple things you go from cities to you know buildings to product to mm. furniture uh, and such because if you had a point of view you would have a point of view on almost everything um and such studios never did and you know you could call them ateliers or what such but they never really specialized in any one thing uh and i think part of the objective of this talk would also be to dispel that one myth i think uh, because i think a lot of us are uh, talking about you know sort of myopic single ended focuses on our work so you categorize a firm as a hospitality firm or a studio as a as a corporate office studio while some may choose to do that for uh, reasons uh, you know that that are entirely their own we don't we do all, all kinds of work but yes most of the work that comes out in the public domain is public access which is hospitality so it was a conscious decision for the studio to do work that was accessible to people at large uh and you will see through this how we arrived at that and why for us at that time or till such till now the best way to do high quality design work is to do it through hospitality um screen chairs on so the studio is a um is a is a 20 people practice and it's uh, it works around a few principles the principles of people so embracing people embracing context understanding environmental needs understanding legibility and flexibility of this i believe architecture has always been about people architecture good architecture has always been about response or the rejection of context and all good architectural practice has been about the built environment and creating a healthy environment through uh, through our contributions now this may be embraced or ignored based on you know what is uh, what we see around us because our cities are necessarily the nicest places to live um to that effect we believe in a process but we believe that the process has to link you 
to your work. It's it's unlike um, I, I know again the word process is very easily thrown around in academic studios, but process means nothing if it doesn't connect you to your work and if it doesn't connect and that means it has to show in the result um, and the process has to be so transparent that if you change one step in the process it has an impact on the result of the project right um, anyway the studio has also been shown at the national gallery of modern art in mumbai and has won various commissions as such including uh, and uh, commissions and awards and publications including uh, you know some from the prime minister's office for the design of the india pavilion and the make in india project so we start with the belief that uh, architects usually render a service and i think that's become the norm uh, especially in our country nowadays where most of us are most studios are actually engaged in doing high spec high end interior works and sort of putting an image together um, and maybe a couple of corners for the interesting photo shoots and that's that but uh, we like to engage as a studio in a more critical process so that with the client so that you together come up with something which is more uh, which is more memorable and which is maybe more effective as as a as a end as a result. Um, our belief is that a project has to last twenty five years to thirty five years as a value system, which means you can build it as well as you want, and obviously it has to be very well built. But the overall conception of the project, in terms of theoretical framework, in terms of the design intent, in terms of uh, uh, you know the, the design output uh, and the aesthetic quality has to be such that it lasts at least three generations now this often in academia the term critical intimacy is misunderstood as what is it that you're doing different mm -hmm. or what is it that you're doing uh, how how is it that you're actually changing things well i don't think uh, critical intimacy is about change. I think critical intimacy is about removing the unnecessary to get to an architectural expression that is very direct. Um, so it feels like a more evolved, maybe fresher, longer lasting expression. To which you obviously have to study the culture and climate and engage in the research and most small studios are uh, engaged in such research. And I think the next line, which is that you go from new buildings to old structures to city and, and you know, product uh, is sort of used as a multidisciplinary uh, description. But the fact is that you need to understand context and you need to understand the place where you're building, the people that you're building for, and an overall process that's not only the process of construction, but also the process of conception in order to, to, to sort of engage in a larger, more memorable uh, conversation on architecture. So I started my work uh, or my examination of architecture in 92. Uh, when I was 13 years old. And I also at that same time started music. So I think one of the things I'd like to also touch upon is how how architecture discipline came to be and how some of the, I, I think I can relate to a lot of the, a lot of the conversation that happens in architecture school and out of architecture school. And I'd like to sort of also, you know, put those in context. Um, so I'm, I'm not a religious person, but I'm a spiritual one, which means that I like to engage with things intensely, be it music or photography or, uh, you know, or architecture now, right? And it was in 98, which was about five years after really sort of, and this was an architecture school. I started architecture school in 97. After I, so this was my second year in architecture school where I actually walked into a library for the first time and started looking at books. 
And I wasn't looking at history of architecture books. I was looking at, uh, you know, the architectural review and I was looking at current architectural um, projects when I saw this small rooftop extension by Ko Blau, which had kind of exploded all over the place. It was, uh, you know, a mock-up of it was made at the Architectural Association and everybody was talking about it. And I realized that architecture could be a lot more than how we see it. And the energy of architecture, even at a smaller scale, even if you weren't doing a high rise building, uh, could start dialogue which are well beyond the scale of the project. And then, you know, as you say, you travel, your travel teaches you. So travel teaches you many things, be it traveling through your own country or traveling, you know, through the rest of the world. There are things to learn. And I think that's part of what uh, in academic studio is about, you know, studying context or studying or, 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 or doing outstation projects or such. I think the idea is to open your mind, to make you get off from your couch to sort of understand how things can be done uh, in very specifically unique manner so that, you know, the outcome of each commission uh, is contextual and is not just typecast into one kind of building. And eventually, of course, nobody gets to vote whether technology will change our lives. And I think we often now relate technology to a mobile phone and a laptop or, you know, a video call. But I think technology also has to do with construction systems and planning systems. So here you see a layering in London where you see, you know, Victorian brick buildings, you see steel and glass, and you see Renzo Piano's, uh, uh, you know, Central St. Giles project right at the back, with, you know, and and you see how that has an effect. And if you also see the, the shard of glass or you see the skyline at the back, uh, you will see that, you know, there are different uh, tectonic and te technological outcomes of buildings. And each one of these is actually a sign of its time because cities are actually a layering of different eras. What remains of a particular era is the architecture of that era. So you see two different bridges, you see on the skyline different or along the, on the riverfront, different eras of buildings that respond or reject each other. You see St. Paul's Cathedral, you see, you know, uh, the walkie talkie, you see the shard of glass and you see, uh, you know, uh, the cheese grater, which is, you know, that's Renzo Piano, that's, that's uh, sorry, that's Richard Rogers, that's Norman Foster, and that is, I keep forgetting the name. Um, and you realize that there are intellectual cues in the built environment, so you need to react to it because that's what feeds you. You know, essentially most of our feeders are what we have around us in our room, in our homes, as we step out of the city. And this, you know, the city is where we spend most of our time. So, and that's what our real feeder is. And we have to realize that mass production or creating human habitat has been dominated by manufacturing, right? So today you can build, since the 1930s, you can build in concrete and it's cost effective because there's an industry set up to create reinforcement, reinforced steel and uh, cement. And it is essentially the rigors of mass production that create, you know, sort of revolutions in the, in, in the world of construction and the world of, um, of architecture. Um, and let's not forget, steel and glass have dominated this or used to dominate it well before concrete. So they're actually, they're actually materials which are older. So there's nothing, there's nothing significantly new that we're talking about right now in, in, the world of, in the world of architecture, except maybe carbon fiber and some hybrid materials. But what we do experience is the result of, you know, assembly lines and parts made customized for the building industry. And we have to negotiate it. We have to negotiate this idea of production and the idea of evolution along with, uh, you know, the notion of creating uh, an extremely customized sort of form. So you've gone from construction being, you know, the outcome of, you know, slow craftsmanship uh, to having, to embracing the impact of high-tech design and manufacturing. This, by the way, is a reference image from Swatch, if you remember, or if you study it, you'll see Swatch was a company that actually saved the, the Swiss watchmaking industry 
because they were being bombarded by because people were buying inexpensive watches from the Japanese industry, which were actually digital and they were more precise. Uh, and that kind of referencing still remains, right? If we're all familiar with these, uh, maybe some of you are not. Uh, the Apple iPod was, was a rage when I was growing up uh, but, and the Apple Watch became a rage since 2015, but they also had their genesis in the past. So if you've studied the works of Dieter Ram, you will see how much of an influence he is on Jonathan Ives and how these references become extremely relevant um, and continue to be relevant for, for our time. That's actually why you study history. So the point I made earlier, you must change. You must travel because that allows you to change it. it you know, it, uh, and you must travel in whichever way possible. Uh, but that doesn't mean you don't come back home. You do. Um, with those references and with having worked abroad and worked in India for a while, uh, I started architecture discipline out of the out of a you know well a typical base um, you know garage. I think that's become a common reference now. Ever since uh, people have started studying the history of how Apple started, but you start, but you start after having established a point of view. Uh, so by the time I graduated from architecture school, I did have a point of view, but I think that point of view has to be honed. You have to, you have to work somewhere. You have to work with enough intensity, enough commitment and enough depth, which means it's important to pick the first practice you really work with and stay there long enough. And I think, and, and a lot of dialogue is, is actually typical of architecture and creative schools to say, oh, I want to experience a lot of things. And you need to experience a lot of things, but you need to anchor yourself somewhere, which means where are you learning your skill sets from? Where are you learning your value systems from? Um, so picking your first studio, A, from where you intern, and more importantly, where you choose to remain for a few years after you graduate. And I think in today's day and age, if you have to make a valuable contribution, one realizes that that studio has to have been around long enough uh, for it to make some. So it takes typically a decade to establish enough enough body in a studio's work uh, and test uh, the theoretical framework that the studio works on for it to be an established studio, for, for it to be doing various relevant things. So I think that's, and that, that's, a, that's a pick, right? And I think a lot of students, a lot of young people tend to confuse the idea of travel, the idea of, you know, experiences and doing many things with being sort of rolling stones that don't sort of stay stable in one place. Uh, I think it is the ability to assimilate various references while you stay static in one place. So to be honest, I've actually only worked in three studios uh, and mine being the fourth. In since the time I started my uh, my architectural journey, now the value systems remain. Whether uh, and these are these are sort of for us these are fundamental hygiene for anything that you may do that you have to engage with sustainability. You have to engage with clean air, good amount of light, reduced energy consumption by using materials that don't off gas, that don't, that don't consume too much, uh, be it embodied or imbibed last long. Uh, you have recyclable water or you work with water life cycle, water cycle and water cycle recyclability. You work with materials that have a certain life cycle, which means they're long lifespan or they're recyclable. And eventually they contribute to place because of the building. If your project just sticks out like a sore thumb, that does not mean it does not evolve. If it sticks out like a sore thumb over 20, 30 years, it's not gonna to contribute to place. So the trick often is to, you know, well, while you do have to make a building which is a holding for itself, the trick is often to source local, to reduce manufacture, to, to reduce transportation and to use material that are high, high life cycle. Eventually, if you work with the age old formula of a reduced time of construction and a prolonged time of use, a reduced cost of construction and a 
reduced cost of maintenance uh, over time, then you will have a physically successful project. But that does not mean you don't source, you don't search for contemporary forms of expression. And I think a very good analogy for that is a Sagrada Familia. If you studied that uh, by Antonio Gaudi, what it was and what it has become in in its new form, uh, and that's a that's a good example. This one reference is the Tijibao Cultural Center from uh, Renzo Piano's building workshop in uh, New Caledonia. And I think if you haven't studied it, you should look it up. It's a great building. Um, so our first project was in 2003. This was this was not an architecture discipline project, it was, but it was one of my first projects in hospitality. It was a small restaurant called Made, Make it, Made in India at the Radisson. Someone's mic is on. Yeah, thank you. So it was a restaurant called Made in India at the Radisson in, uh, in New Delhi. And this, you know, well, the idea was we had we'd actually realized that the dining out or, or a lot of hospitality in India is about being decadent and sort of creating trauma. So this had references from Indian uh, calligraphy, from the idea of whales. This was the first time LED lights were used uh, way back. We'd actually got a local manufacturer to develop LED lighting for us. Um, and it wasn't even prevalent in the West when we did this because it allowed color change, it allowed intense coloring. It, 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 there were fairly long life uh, light fixtures and we had various references. And we realized through that, that you know, it's important that you don't always interpret a client's values in the literal sense. You must, and that's again, what I mean about critical intimacy that you, while you learn and you listen very closely to when a client is speaking, you must also be able to filter through it and contribute in a manner where it is effective for uh, the outcome of their project or, or their business as such. It, each project is not just about the glorification of the architectural studio or the architect per se, it's about creating a successful project at the end. What we found is through our processes, we end up creating projects that are not only successful for our clients, but they're also successful architecturally. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of move into our first architecture discipline project. And we believe that return to tradition is a myth. Nobody ever achieves that. Uh, and our first project was a hotel project in, one of our first projects was a hotel project in Rajasthan. Uh, with the idea and the composition was sent, was basically uh, orchestrated around you know points lines and planes in the valley in a valley of Udaipur which which basically goes from being absolutely lush green to completely arid so a huge change in seasons and everything in between so this was a Ranakpur project. I think a lot has been written about it, uh, but what the project did was use, you know, a, a compositional grid, broke the compositional grid um, and created, you know, a single large hotel building, but also a resort-like composition over about seven acres of land um, in a very complex, programmatically complex space. So while people say, Hotels are challenging, hotels and hospitals are challenging because they're programmatically complex. We feel that there's enough liberty in them to, uh, to create or enough space in any building program to create unique architectural expressions. Uh, what the Ranakpur project does is it uses passive and active energy responses as well as an overall response to context and materials that are found at the site. So barring the steel and glass, the all the all the stone that you see was mined at the site you know uh, what of and a lot of what is called quarry rubbish which is uh, you know rubbish material that that comes out with stone chips that have been used to actually um, uh, to create the building as such um, a lot of traditional building techniques such as using minimal concrete spanning using stone 
supplementing the span using steel trusses, using uh, you know clear served and servant areas, um, and basically juxtaposing the light with the heavy, um, the glass with the uh, the glass with the stone, is what Ranakpur became the the project Ranakpur became about. Um, through an intense series of drawing exercises, through using, you know, these are 13, 14 odd meter tall spaces with very large ventilated roofs, but minimal steel sections. So we were actually using the idea, we were, we were, used, we were structurally the building kind of plays a balancing act with a staircase that counter, that counterweighs what's going on inside. So everything is a sort of system that works as opposed to multiple independent things. To, uh, you know, which are which are disconnected from each other and just sort of slapped on, it became a more complex architectural system with sort of buttresses to to again reduce the amount of material consumed to uh, creating you know jalis, which I think which I believe are now you know using perforated sheets. We created a lot of jalis, which are now all over the place. I think they've been copied a lot, or they've been they've been used as a motif a lot now. Uh, over the last seven years. So, and using a ventilated roof to actually create, uh, to create an air, you know, to, to, to create a, an actively cooled ventilated roof. Uh, what I learned, what we learned from here, we also actually developed a whole new air conditioning system that, that was using something called thermal storage, using a system called geothermal cooling uh, and displacement ventilation, all three or four of such to create a very, very efficient, 100% naturally ventilated building to that won the Emerson Cup for the first time for us. Uh, and the Emerson Award is for energy efficiency in buildings. And this was the first time a building in Rajasthan got, got uh, such, an, such an award. I think what's also important to learn here is how some of these things, some of, some of what we do becomes a victim of its own success because the the Jali motif became so widely copied and so widely replicated that people stop seeing this in the context of it being, you know, a much more valuable, larger project. And often just look at the Jalis and say, oh, you know, uh, I've seen this before. Now you've seen it before because it's been repeated everywhere else uh, since, but this was really the first time it was done. So I think, it's a, it's a bit like the Beatles, right? It's a success and a failure. Or if you if you come if you sort of take that analogy for a famous for a popular song, right? That 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 uh, that you listen to very often when you're when you're growing up, but then you hate listening to it as you grow old. Just heard it so many times. Um, this was the first real time we used, you know, sun from different angles. So this is actually the west light, and we realized that. We studied how natural light moves around, how it changes, how the how natural light is blue uh, in the north, and how it's how it's more orange towards the west, and how both can lend themselves to creating spatial characteristics. Um, that's a diagram of how the the displacement system works. We also believe that a lot of our architectural expression has to be clear. So these are air conditioning return air ducts which are which sort of express themselves as architectural elements in space some of these motifs are repeated but the idea is that when you start creating your distinct architectural elements and narratives which is uh, they they also start telling a story they start telling people who are experiencing the space to walk through to to sort of question it because your eyes actually ask the first question right your eyes are the first things that engage with your built environment and then the narrative becomes more apparent. Sometimes you ask the question, sometimes you just sense it as different. It also creates a series of layering. So what we do often is, is do something called, we, we work with a system called, with a principle of relaxed detailing, which means you don't necessarily layer one thing into another. You don't hide services and construction systems below another, but you actually rationalize each one of them, make each one of them beautiful, detail them to the last logical step, and then actually layer them one over the other so that they can be seen. So as you can see here, you see the glass, you see the, the block works, you see where the concrete elements are, you see the air conditioning elements, and you see uh, the glazing elements. 
and that logic continues with something called dissonance where you know you break the space out with color um, and that creates a certain form of expression the cottages are such where you know the the site was overturned because the site was fundamentally rubble and these this building actually had the floating foundation the foundation the, because the water table is just one and a half foot from the from the ground surface so the building hardly has a foundation even though these buildings are actually 9 or 10 or 11 meters tall and every monsoon of course there are solar collectors of course to collect heat and energy and then the water sort of floods in is collected uh, in the site itself so this becomes a seasonal river we didn't want to have you know the area flooded with lights so you have we developed lighting systems so that everything bounces off these uh, awnings you get you get you get basically a sense of you know the moonlight when you're walking through uh, it's completely reflected there's no glare at the same time we were uh, and that's the other thing we we at the studio and that's something i should have said earlier we don't pitch you know very often studios tend to go to clients and say you know give us work we never do that we let people come to us um, while we focus our energies on our own work we don't focus our energies on the business of architecture our our, our focus is on um, on the fundamental principles of architecture itself and i think if if architecture discipline is considered a successful practice it it is that once you do a few successful projects um people will gravitate towards you know those principles once they see the success of those principles so towards the end of the ranakpur project we were asked to do uh, you know a town house town hall for a city this is a very different project in its expression it's a it's an extremely contemporary building in bangalore because it was for the launch or the or the or the introduction of a whole new city which is a future city so what would the future of urbanism be what would and while that may remain the same what is the future of architectural expression this is a completely actively cool building made of three layers of glass steel you know the span over here is 17 odd meters clear span there's a suspended slab there are laced columns which are extremely thin um you can read about this building on on our website or you can read about it on our daily as well actually most of these projects that you will see are it uses you know the same idea of perforated sheets but uses them to create a different visual interference pattern which is called a moray so while you move across the building the building tends seems to seems to be moving in itself because the lighting or the or the shadow patterns are fairly dynamic so the building is constantly changing in its visual appearance here again the material a long life cycle we used aircraft grade paint uh, a lot of quarry rubbish yet and the building stays on a plinth with you know whatever has been mined all around the city um but the fundamental principles of of architecture remain the same you know of using long life span material of using local material as much as possible of using recyclable materials of uh, uh creating an architectural expression that is contemporary is is futuristic um asks uh or, or engages you with some sense of curiosity so that uh the building becomes dynamic without relying on too much gimmickry right and you see here again there is a, always a sense of jugglery with structure so you know these are 17 meter clear span the building 105 meters long yet you see the structure is very very light but robust you see how ceilings and elements flow through i think this was also a project way back in 2012 so this is now almost a decade old and um, again ventilate uh, you know displacement ventilation systems and such this is natural light this is not artificial light um and the red egg is an auditorium at that time the entire building was powered by solar panels uh, with an energy storage system right here with all recycled recycled water which was all rain water run off from the building itself um we're also doing schools um but i think the next slide should have been this which is that often when you do something so unconventional you also have to think about methods of communicating it so we used a cartograph and we used a cartographer from england 
to actually communicate the idea of the township, communicate the idea of the discovery center, what it does, what it has to be, and what a future urban scape should and could be like, as opposed to creating just, you know, glossy 3D renders. Um, this is a school, I'm going to skip that. Um, we also create sometimes, you know, pop-ups. So this was when the Beetle was launched in India in 2010, they asked us to design something. This was in Bombay at the Mahalakshmi race course that we designed a circus tent for the launch of the Beetle. We also do public pop-ups and such, which are kiosks. I'm going to ignore that. Um, and then in 2015, we were approached by the prime minister's office to do uh, a pavilion uh, because Make in India was a new program and the, and the Chancellor of Germany and the Prime Minister of India at that time were to, were to launch this new program internationally. So we were asked to design the pavilion. This pavilion was done in, uh, was designed nine days, 17,000 square feet, nine days, just two people along with me. And it was, um, it was built in 22 days to the highest spec, right? So every possible challenge. And I think sometimes, or actually more often than not, one of the objectives or one of the challenges in architectural architecture practice is that you are given, you are thrown a lot of constraints and you will see that, you, you know, often people talk about limitations, constraints, how difficult it is to work with a kind of, with a, with a particular kind of client, especially say the government. Uh, but what you have to overcome in your process is, is to turn all those limitations on the head to come out with something unique. Um, so for us, we were, this was the first time we were working with the government and we were thrown that challenge to say, listen, we know you've never done this before and we know this is hard for you. This is going to be, going to be very difficult. And it, but it's also a big risk we are taking by giving a practice like yours, this kind of work. But we've heard you are one of the best at this. And we need to show, we need to put our best foot forward for the rest of the world. Let's not forget that in these nine days also, industrial policy keeps changing. You know, each policy, each component of, industri of, of, an, in, of a national policy changes every day. And you cannot communicate that incorrectly. There were changes happening till the morning of, till one hour before the inauguration. Uh, and those are those are in, those are national policy level changes. So you need to be able to embrace those and communicate those. Um, I think the reason I've we've got this project out here is because it was a, a significant project for us. B, it was probably one of the biggest challenges we overcame successfully. Uh, and C, to say that you know uh, no client is difficult. It's only uh, as difficult as you sort of. As, as the limitations you sort of put on yourself. Um, I, I don't think we're showing this today, but I'm showing the Mohalla clinics today, but if you search for the Mohalla clinics in Delhi, you'll see that we've also recently done these uh, clinics out of containers for, uh, for, uh, for the government of Delhi. And now we're being approached with governments all over the world for, uh, you know, for similar solutions. Now, well, I'm not going to get into the planning of the, of the India Pavilion. You will find this online, but you'll see that, you know, for something which is known to be an exhibition, this is actually an extremely customized, very, very bespoke build. And it was done in record time uh, by a small studio at that time. We were, we were just nine people. And all I could do was spare two people to, to work on this pavilion at the time to also creating icons, which are now national icons, um, to the level of sculptures and, you know, with variations. It was all done in nine days, including exhibitions of how a smart city should be, what the smart city planning is for, for India across, across the entire country, for how the policy will, will determine the outcome for what a future Chandigarh could be. Uh, to what our future street sections would be like and such. Um, we're also doing some high rise projects in Mumbai. This is, you know, a proposal for a, a tower at Nariman Point is probably the tallest building in India. And it's, a, it's an office complex. But that brings me to, 
uh, our other engagement or our most intense engagement, which is hospitality. Hospitality because it, it moves because the outcome is checked in public domain very quickly, which means that our unpredictable users or your user base is unpredictable. So your communication has to be very strong. Um, incidentally, the first hospitality project we did after the after Ranakpur and uh, and the Radisson project was well, the Radisson project was in two thousand four, and the Ranakpur project was in two thousand ten or eleven, uh, and this was a project in two thousand seventeen. So it's not so it, there was a seven year gap before we did another hospitality project, and this is. A con was an adaptive reuse slash conservation project. It, this is in one of the oldest hotels in the country. This is nearly 200 years old. It's the Oberoi Grand at Calcutta, where we are refurbishing everything. So the first part of the strategy was, what do you refurbish first? And the first thing we said was, let's announce the change by doing the main restaurant. You know, And uh, because the building has such a history, it was involved in the Second World War, it it was um, it's an icon. It's still considered a cultural icon or a or a or a, or a celebratory icon in, by the people of Calcutta. So we had to we had to sort of um, uh, embrace that. It has it, it's it's seen as you know a marquee architectural uh, landmark. It's a Grade One listed building, which means you can't do too much. We um, we were, well, again, with a series of challenges and limitations, we were thrown into this. This built, what the project, by the way, is an assembly. It's a construction assembly, where while the building is in Calcutta, it was, it was the, the interior was entirely crafted out of factories near Delhi and shipped and assembled as a kit of parts. So everything that you see here was fabricated in Delhi as a kit of parts and has been just pretty much knocked out because it was impossible to do the physical build as well as the, the physical build for the interior and the strengthening, retrofitting of the services and the existing structure at the side at the same time. Remember, this is an operating hotel. It's one of the busiest hotels in Calcutta. So you can't really shut down. You can't really make too much of a noise. And yet, when you do an overall like project, which was one of our learnings in hospitality, that you know, there's really the only client we felt in India that had the vision uh, to let to understand that design and architecture has to last a few generations before it should be refreshed or need, should need change. And I really mean that. If you look at most of the houses that people live in, they are three generation houses before they brought down. And I think that's something that we as architects have forgotten, and that's contributing to the kind of environmental disasters we are seeing. And, and the building industry is a large contributor to it. So for this particular project, we pretty much, we took references of the built history of the project. We scanned and 3D scanned multiple elements. We rationalized them using, um, you know, using computation. And they were then, uh, they were then, further rationalized into construction systems, into scale and rhythm, into, uh, you know, sort of into polyisms where you go from one layer to another layer to another layer. So you'll see that there's, it's not one thing, there's enough variety in the space, but it there's multiple rep repetitions of different different rhythms. It's, it's a bit like reggae music and you, and you sort of create a space um, with 650 unique, works of art. And again, these, these terms that I'm throwing around are loosely thrown. They're only a fact, but they're not what makes the space. It's not the 650 pieces of art, distinct pieces of art that make the space. It's the space onto itself. Each one of these elements contributes with you know a mobile that sort of is a little more high tech uh, in appearance, adds a little bit of gliss and you know sort of dissonance to the space, another layer of and another juxtaposition and such. Everything that you see here was made in India. Everything that you see here, including the light fixtures and the mobile were all designed by uh, the studio. Nothing was bought uh, except the technical light fixtures and maybe the air conditioners. Right, and you always face challenges. So here's the bar at the other end. 
and while we were dem- while we were sort of breaking the bar and opening it out we suddenly realized there's a 200 year old column that supports steel column that supports six stories of the building above which was never recorded in any of the as built so we had to come up with an intervention right then to create and for what we did for that was create a wine studio and a media console so that um, we could embrace that within the architectural of um, you know expression of the space most recently we've also been asked to we we also just finished the the renovation of the obroy amar villas which is now a 20 year old building and this was finished during the pandemic it was a five month renovation for the entire hotel it's the only project that actually overlooks the taj mahal directly and it was showing its age so we were asked to uh, we were asked to do well so to start with again the the public area where we've done a series of prefabricated cross walls uh, with a minimum minimal intervention like i said there are, there are some architectural projects such as the contemporary ones where the services are exposed and the services are kind of uh, the services are used to create an architectural narrative in a building of this nature the services including the sprinkler fire sprinkler systems the, the lighting systems all have to be there because these are public buildings so they are technically very complex but in this case they're all hidden so often when you go to a space you know especially a restaurant with a large one you'll see sprinklers you'll see lights you'll see ac grill in here you'll see nothing and that's part of you know understanding and challenging a space to say how do you do this how do you create a space how do you make it loftier how do you make it feel larger get to retain a sense of intimacy um create a cross vaulted system but have it feel fresh and contemporary and something that will remain uh relevant for the for the in the coming years um and create enough tactile quality in it for it to be engaging so the cross vaulted system was such that it would actually take you know the the aperture of the design such that they would take and amplify the sense of natural light and the loftiness of the space um there is enough craft in it there's enough sense of craft but the sense of craft actually comes from machining not not from not from hand and that becomes obvious in the sort of crisp almost robotic expression of the space in itself um i think this is the segue and the segue is into some of our corporate offices where you know we you know it sort of extends our philosophy of uh it is by the way the corporate office for uh, the chairman of the oberoi hotels uh and it's about it this is this sits in gurgaon so that's the context of gurgaon you see the you see the expressway right there but how do you create an island of excellence or a sort of island of peace and calm in a city as intense as as gurgaon and i think that it's kind of also relevant to to bombay where you know what can you do to actually get a sense of calm in a city which is so hypercharged um and you'll see that there's a central courtyard again everything here is designed by us the rugs the furniture all crafted and made in india um but it, you know what we most important most most important here is the overall sense of transparency for an office that actually requires a lot of privacy and that comes through puncturing a courtyard giving the two layers of glass so only if you're walking through the corridor can you actually see what's going on otherwise that's on the whole is you know it's a private space uh with a sort of island of calm and rooms that have privacy again um ceilings that go beyond coves which are sort of which which have diffuse lighting and such but on the whole services are kind of hidden and invisible and to the other side which is actually bang opposite the same to create an a, a project uh, an office for the projects development team, which is very different in its architectural expression but this but similar in its values where the space is more communal more open ended still has a courtyard still has but has a more sort of usable courtyard space has has a more open plan feel yet has a sense of 
being high spec and luxury um, or luxurious uh, and has a sense of memory and has a sense of you know sort of acknowledging engagement so this is a 6 meter long aircraft wing that we that we we well we bought an aircraft and we chopped it up because the the person who uses this office is actually an automobile and aircraft aficionado when you're sitting right on top this is the only thing that he has in the office uh, just one wing and that's all the office was was a, was about where it was restored um so the office feels a little high tech and yet very well crafted um there is no distraction in it it is not unnecessarily opulent but the space is engaging and you know it and feels again luxurious because the way because the ample natural light and uh, you know loftiness in the in the space as such um these are actually the mock up these are I, i'm segueing again and these are i'm actually going to skip through these this is still the overall calcutta but we're also doing um we've also done the overall new delhi which is again the most the most marquee uh, hospitality project in that there is in delhi one of the most one of one of the most iconic pro properties in india um again everything here is made in india and designed by us it's a and these are the luxury suites where i think what's important is to understand how ergonomically clear a space has to be what do you have to feel as an outsider in a space because you're creating a space that is a room or a suite and these are these are suites what what do you do uh, how do you create a space for somebody who's going to use it only for a few nights for him it for this for the user it must be instantly comfortable like home but it's not a space that they can customize uh, before they walk in to make it feel like home so the art has to be in the right place the right it has to be the right art it has to be the right books it has to be the right amount of sense of glamour without it being opulent it has to make you feel positive when you wake up and it has to make you and and comfortable when you wake up and instantly and comfortable and calm when you go to sleep and i think a lot is done in hospitality or a lot is overdone in this in in the world of hospitality i think this is an example of how a lot of restraint must be used to create spaces in india that are luxurious yet familiar and comfortable long lasting and enduring at the same time um and it doesn't just have to be one expression it can actually be two expressions so while what you see here was a more 70s or 80s inspired art deco influence what you see here is actually a more victorian influence in the same space but they're actually really the same space um they're actually very similarly laid out it's just that the tools you use for expression are very different so both the projects which is you know the, the corporate office project for the oberoi as well as the oberoi new delhi demonstrate the same thing that you can you know that you have to have that sort of versatility and skill within within your value system to create uh architecture which is or or design which is uh, which which is engaging for all kinds right so you you want that sense of differentiation um these projects also by the way led us to the creation of a new brand we were involved in creating the dna and the fundamental workings of the postcard hotels which started with using brownfield project which is because we believe that it's important to not ignore buildings of the past which is what we learned from the oberoi calcutta and some of the other projects we've done as adaptive reuse projects and, and conservation projects in jodhpur and such so we started by taking three old buildings in goa and refurbishing them restoring them adding some dissonant elements to create small format hotels and this was this project was a project that we programmed so we programmed before this nobody had done absolute uh, five star luxury in just nine room properties um and this was an exercise in how do you conserve yet how do you create uh, an architectural language that has that has enough layering 
for contemporary use and for future use. Um, wherein we collaborated with even fixture manufacturers or, or, or uh, bathway manufacturers to actually create custom products for us. Um, this is one of the oldest projects, one of the oldest surviving buildings, it's 350 years old in Goa, which became one such postcard hotel. Uh, and here we used a lot of what was old, what was new, um, what was old and some of the things that were actually, a lot of what is new created to make it look old and feel old with the same sort of, and that doesn't just look old, but actually performs in the same way. So the bed creaks when you sit on it, is, is extremely tall and such. To creating more bohemian spaces, to creating a very, very high tech construction on the seashore. This is the only hotel project on, on high tide line on, you know, adjoining the sea in India that has been built in the last 25 years. It is a resort near Mangalore. It's built entirely of steel. Uh, it's prefabricated, but it's also layered with uh, coconut rattan, which is a material that you that is prevalent in in that region. Where this building sort of comes together, is put up on site with a minimal intervention. Within two months, you have a 22 room operating hotel. Um, these are renders, but the, the project's very near completion now. to working well, of course, through sketches and endemons and whatnot. I'm just going to run through this. Um, this is a repeat. And yeah, I'm gonna actually take questions now. If there are any, I, we can, we have many more that we can keep talking about. This is, you know, an Italian restaurant and, and such. Uh, oh yeah, I can talk about this one at the last. This is, you know, this, if you've seen the Oyo townhouses, we actually came up with them and the first three were done abroad. And the idea was that we do, the idea was to actually clean up our city through subterfuge to take a brownfield project to create a brand out of something that had nothing to do with a brand. Um, and these are three distinct ones in London that I'm showing you, uh, where we, we started with these and then they, uh, we created the catalog out of London. It then came into, uh, they were brought into Delhi and then taken all over. I think there are a few in Bombay as well. Um, but I, but, I, but we uh, created the catalog for the projects abroad and then we exited and allowed them to use their team to create them. I think this, I think the, the product has been diluted, uh, but that's not something that's uh, that's not something that that's happening in postcard. I think in postcard the product's actually becoming stronger. Uh, these are a few other engagements of, you know, sort of smaller hotels. Uh, this is in New Delhi. It's a completely prefabricated building that was built over one year, 30 odd rooms. All the rooms are made in a factory and sort of just plugged in, almost like containerized rooms. And we're doing larger formats of those as well. Where a container becomes a plug-in module for a room. Right, I'm going to stop here. I'll take questions. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful presentation. And those were some really amazing projects. And I think uh, the audience can start asking questions. And I would request them to keep their videos on while asking the questions if possible. And people joining in from Facebook Live can post their questions in the comments. That will be conveyed to sir as well. Uh, hello, sir. Um, my question is uh, actually regarding your project based in Bangalore. So um, the auditorium space of the structure um, has a very fascinating egg-shaped form. But um, also furthermore, it has a very distinctive red colored facade. So uh, the question is like what measures were taken to get a dynamic structure? structure such as that to get along with its uh, like neighboring neighboring surrounding architecture and what was the response of the society like mainly the variety of users using the space so 
So A, the auditorium, the 35 people auditorium, it, the form was arrived at through a series of acoustic and visual exercises, and it was finally resolved parametrically, um, but it was crafted by hand. B, the color, um, it's red, because when you sit in an air, in a in a basic desolate surrounding, let's not forget that red is the longest wavelength, so you see it from a distance, right? So when you when you um, so this was being this is this is a greenfield project, which means there was nothing in the surrounding, and you see and and you would basically need to create something that was easily um, visible, identifiable, trackable. For people who are who are moving past in their cars at 120 kilometers an hour, and that's why the red. Uh, it also becomes a beacon eventually, and you know, so it is high visibility, um, and it's been embraced so much so by people that. Uh, let's not forget that you don't have to fit in. Every architecture project doesn't have to blend, and that was my point. The contrast is very important. Juxtaposition is very important. So not every building should blend in and just sort of become brown like everything else. Um, so this is a building that stands out. This is a building that is a beacon. It is a holding, it is a sign. And over the years, what now happens there is even children, uh, well, the Edinburgh Science Festival is hosted here. Rock concerts are hosted here. It becomes a backdrop for that because it's become a, it, this building has become an icon for the city of Bangalore. And you'll see that there are people who come here just to visit the building. Tell me, when was the last time you said, oh, this is an ordinary building and I want to visit it? Right? Or how, when was the last time people say that? Or do you actually say, oh, this is a unique building and I want to visit it? Now, that doesn't mean that every project has to be unique, that, that everything cannot be screaming for attention. So, and that's when that's why studying context becomes important. So sometimes you have to be respectful. And I think if you look at some of James Sterling's work, especially the, 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 the Tate Britain, which, uh, which James Sterling did, not what Herzog de Miron did, is a great understanding of how do you extend something which has a naturally, which has, a, which has an old, very, very well-established and charged context into something new, right? Uh, I think the quest for, and, and what's very distinct in the studio is that there is a quest for new architecture and there is an embracing of old architecture, right? Because a building that exists is already built, it's sustainable. So it's probably easier to, in more most cases than not, it's probably easier to retrofit it and continue using it for future use as opposed to, uh, as opposed to creating something which is, which is, which is, uh, absolutely new. That's in a brownfield context, in the case where something exists. But when something does not exist, you should create something. I believe you should create something that is architecture for the future. Does that answer your questions? Yes, sir. Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, sir. Good morning. Uh, so I want to ask, like, um, architecture, it deals with designing spaces which are mostly comfortable and like they should even be functional and safe. And when we talk about safety, women's safety, it is an important concern. So uh, could you give us some insights on how architecture and interiors, they help respond to these concerns? Well, look, I think there are some things which are not, which are beyond the domain of architecture. But if you create environments or built environments which are, which are generally well lit, which have, which are, which are positive, transparent, and clear, you're creating a, a you know, a positive, policeable or self-policeable environment. And I think you should study self-policing. Uh, when you talk about women's safety and 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 generally safe built environments, right? Uh, health and safety is one, uh, but sort of policing is a whole different conversation. But I think they are all fundamentally addressed when you stop creating architecture with nooks and crannies and clutters and cluttered spaces and you know dark spaces. 
and you will see that i think most of our work does not have that most of our work strives for a certain kind of clarity and uh, openness hello sir this is adishri patil from second year so i would like to ask a question about the facades so how would the facade de design and the other elements of facade help the building to be more energy efficient and at the same time provide a better interior and environment i think you must understand that you have to you have to i think you have to study what space needs transparency what needs translucency and what needs opacity right but in my understanding most spaces will benefit from natural light and so this is a generic your, your question is a bit too vast into generic for me to answer but fundamentally if you address the need for light the need for air and the need for privacy in a space you will find that answer in terms of energy efficiency there are you can either deal with buildings which are with with materials which increase time lag which means the amount of time it takes for heat to penetrate or you can work with uh, an elevational system that cools itself that heat that that responds very quickly to the environment so the moment the sun goes down it becomes cool right as long as you dealt with air circulation ventilation you'll be fine okay sir thank you Oh uh, yes, sir. I have uh, one question. Uh, all of the projects have a very strong architectural language, and as student, when there is uh, so much to be inspired by, can you tell us some? How uh, can you tell us how can one derive inspiration from your projects, keeping in mind the context? Mm, I, I, you know, I think. I think strong languages. are the outcome of a series of processes so if you want to and and i can't say that you should derive inspiration or not if you find them inspiring you will be inspired what you can do is you can study them to understand them a little further right and there's you know what 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 we're fortunate with is that there's a lot of publication journalistic critical uh, and documentary for our for most of our works online right you will find them between our own website and you know some uh popular uh, architectural portals to sort of to understand the processes or the you know the critical concerns that we had for making a project in such a way okay yes sir also i have one more question is that uh, in the 21st century we uh, like how what what is the importance of the relationship between artists architects and craftsmen in the 21st century i i don't think that i don't think that that importance changes based on era so each one has their own role and sometimes those roles overlap but i don't think an unnecessary amount of importance should be placed place should be should be placed on art i think a lot of that dialogue happens and that's why natural dialogue you know you need to have you need to be sensitive to the culture of a space and a and a space and a and a place must have each place has its own culture uh, which is often documented through art and through literature um as such why is it that we don't but but does that mean you go pasting paintings all over the place and you start pasting poetry all over buildings it doesn't right so you need to have you should be some um so i think you need to be you need to you 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 can always use a myriad of references right you can use art music poetry literature politics science as a reference have a variety of ideas and suggestions that they wish to implement in the spaces that have been designed provided that have been provided so like while designing such spaces how would an architect approach towards narrowing down this wants into an aesthetic and functional design 
think you need to i think i think what's important is to listen to a client and to understand what is a a relevant need and what is what is superfluous you have to do that for yourself you use the same filters how you convince someone is entirely your skill set yes sir okay sir thank you sir are there any more questions i think not i think with that we can end today's session so thank you so much sir for joining us today and for that wonderful presentation and i would like to compliment the wonderful guitar collection in your background as well <laughs> it was and the musical analogies that you made they were really enjoyable and right. uh, could would you like to say some concluding statements to end today's session um no i think i think you have to i think you have to find your own path um as a student but you have to do this you have to engage in a certain direction of research make sure instinctively it is the right direction of research for you uh, stick with it and don't forget as you as you grow older and as you graduate find the right studios to work with ensure that the studios you work with are studios and even only apply to the ones that you really want to work with stay there long enough learn because there's enough and more to learn right ensure that that studio has enough depth in its work enough systems in place because you know as a as a profession your your you know your learning in this profession your learning never stops so the fact is your most intense learning happens for the first 20 years of your working life and those if if you get to the right studio you're actually going to be paid for learning what you would like otherwise spend a lot of money on to do a master's program yeah thank you, thank you for that good, good luck bye 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 thank, thank you, you sir thank you everyone for joining in thank you